Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to this session. And uh, we'll introduce ourselves very briefly. I will give some introductory remarks, and then we'll turn it over to the panel to give you some more background of what uh, I think we believe to be a very interesting, uh, somewhat unique uh, collaboration between a not-for-profit and a new corporation. Um, I'm Chuck Henry. I'm president of the Council on Library and Information Resources. Uh, I'm Carol Mandel. Is, yeah, this is Anya. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, Dean uh, Emerita of uh, New York University Libraries and um, uh, doing various various things. Uh, some of them uh, in the as a um, I'm on the Clear Board. That's why one reason I'm here, and also a Clear Distinguished Presidential Fellow. I'm doing some work. I'll be talking about. Hi, I'm Stephen Rintut. I'm president of Coherent Digital. I'm Christian DuPont, Associate uh, University Librarian for Scholarly Resources and Burns Librarian at Austin College, and I engage with Coherent Digital as a strategic advisor. And I'm Wayne Graham. I'm the Chief Information Officer for CLEAR. Well, thank you all. And we will have some time at the end for some questions. I hope you have, uh, I hope you have some uh, interest in this topic, too. The, uh, briefly, um, about 2014, 2015, uh, Cliff Lynch, uh, in his uh, roadmap talk uh, for the coalition meeting that year, um, uh, re made uh, a nice reference to a, a new committee, then new committee, called uh, the Committee on Coherence at Scale. The Committee on Coherence at Scale was a group of people uh, convened by my organization, CLEAR, uh, with uh, the generous funding from uh, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Don Waters at the time, and he was intimately involved with this. Uh, the committee was composed of uh, college presidents, university presidents, provosts, there were publishers, university librarians, uh, archivists, um, any number of uh, professions uh, represented on this committee. And it was brought together uh, to look more closely at the academic information landscape. And we got together because we all had uh, sort of very, f very similar um, uh, unease, I guess, in, in, in the environment, the information environment in which we were working. Uh, part of that was we were looking at uh, the publishing models. We were looking at the flow of information, the flow of knowledge from research to publications to libraries to, to archives. And we found. Um, a lot of firewalls, we found a lot of lost data, we found information that was very difficult to, uh, to, to find in the first place. Um, the, it was disconcerting, there were also, I think then and now, there was not a lot of guarantee that something that was published is going to be around f for a while. And the publishers, uh, particularly in the sciences, uh, don't, have, uh, don't, make those, don't make those guarantees. So we're looking out on a, on a landscape that was um, where information, which is really the lifeblood of what we were all about, um, was ephemeral, costly, redundant, uh, and sometimes impossible to find. And it, complicating that was the culture of higher education itself. And one of the key aspects that we focused on in those years and those deliberations was the problem of competition. Um, universities and colleges, libraries, um, were competing constantly, I guess still do, uh, competing for faculty, competing for staff, for a number of books, for a number of journals, for grants, for students. Um, this incessant pursuit of what I call the arithmetic of prestige. And what that did is, and we were all part of it. My organization was part of it, and uh, everyone at the table was part of it, too. It was very hard to extricate oneself. Once you get into that competition, it's very hard to get out, for one thing. And once you're in, uh, the incentives to collaborate, the incentives to become, heaven forbid, interdependent, um, are, are vanishingly small. 
Um, if you, uh, we used to talk about, uh, uh, hypothetically, if someone was applying for a presidency of a university and, and she sat down and said, I think, you know, what we ought to do is cut well, half of our athletic programs. We need to become interdependent with the two other universities in this city. We need to share collections and share staff and we can pair this and we can focus and concentrate on a fewer number of areas of expertise. Would she get the job? I doubt it. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was, this is the, this is the um, environment that we were up against. So we discussed uh, for several years how we might form a collaboration, uh, how we might address this uh, really multifaceted problem of uh, disjointed information, expensive and redundant information, and a culture that really uh, was not about to change very much. The, uh, the committee eventually dissolved. Um, it was basically through attrition. About half the members went on to different positions. And we had, a, uh, uh, admittedly, a very difficult time of continuity. So the committee disbanded after about four or five years of discussion. And um, we uh, have been you know, speaking intermittently since then about this problem, which persists. So we're here this morning because there was another member of the Committee on Coherence at Scale who was then a board member of CLEAR, Stephen Rintot, who is now president of Coherent Digital. And we're going to talk about how that ideas or those values or the looking at ways to streamline, make coherent, make cost effective, and build communities as opposed to dividing so many of us around academic information. So I will turn to Stephen. And, Thank you, uh, Chuck. So I was in ch inspired by Chuck. Um, this committee really struck me as if it was going to solve a really, really major problem. The trouble was moving from strategy into action. So in 2018, um, uh, I left the company I founded, uh, Alexander Street Press, and I was an absolute loss. I, I love my work and I had nothing to do. And my wife said to me, you have to find something to do. <laughs> and I went, I went back and said to myself, wow, I wonder if there's something I could do with this uh, committee idea and actually build some coherence at scale. So what I did was I started talking to a number of people that you know, people like Brian Shotlander and Jim Neal. And what I heard back more and more was, that actually, in one sense, we're not doing collectively that good a job. How is that Facebook can actually capture an item on a phone, disseminate it to three billion people for free in a matter of seconds, and that same journey for an academic artifact is measured in months and thousands of dollars, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars? Surely there's something we could learn from Facebook and other social networks. So the more I did an audit of what's out there, I realized that there's literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of tools that actually could enable us to do this. There are tools like OCR engines, there's content management systems, there's um, HTR, there's entity extraction tools. A lot of the things that we do uh, manually could actually be automated, but the fundamental challenge that we're facing is that they're not coherent. So to give you an example, what happens is um, you could use an AI engine to create metadata, but many dissemination systems require nicely formed marks to give uh, a decent user experience. So that then means that you can't just use the AI engine. Um, so I began to think, I wonder if we actually created a coherent system. And that's actually why we called the company Coherent Digital because our idea was to take tools that are already extant and actually link them together so that they began to generate some coherence. So in 2018, um, I formed the company uh, Coherent Digital with a mission to tame wild content. And the idea was that we're actually doing a pretty good job with books and journals. It's the materials that are, as it were, wild. And with my colleague here, Christian, uh, I had a, a meeting in um, uh, Needham, Mass, and uh, Newton, Mass, mm -hmm. and Christian said to me, hmm, I think there's a lot we could do. So the more I looked, the more I realized that in um, certain areas, there was a great deal of phenomenal content. 
And the one we landed on to begin with was policy reports. CNI, as a think tank, puts out great reports. These reports uh, typically are not in libraries in the same sense that books and journals are. And the more I looked at it, there are literally thousands of organizations that put out excellent quality reports. What I noticed was even things like uh, the principles of open publishing, after five or six years, tend to disappear. So we said to ourselves, what tools would we need to be able to bring coherence to this content? And we decided we would need a capture tool, an enrichment tool, a dissemination tool, and an engagement tool. In other words, we wanted to do the entire process from literally capturing to actually engaging with faculty and scholars. Um, we built um, and licensed and co-opted existing software for the most part. I don't want to give you the idea that we've created something incredibly unique here. Really all we've done is lend coherence to what's already there. We built a thumbnail generator, uh, a publication date extraction tool, a title extraction tool, um, we took an OCR engine, and with this, we were able to launch a database called Policy Commons, which indexed and aggregated about three million items. The key distinction of this is that we were able to index that amount of material for pennies. Um, we also were able to um, uh, get 50,000 end users registered over the space of a year. And our usage shows us that the content is actually very actively being used. As part of that initiative, we noticed that there was a great deal of content from Africa. In fact, we noticed that uh, of the think tanks that we were indexing, over 850 came from Africa. In the global south, it is far harder to find money for APCs. It's far harder to go through the traditional book publishing process and yet the content is still urgent and necessary. So the more we looked at that, the more I thought, and I began to talk with Chuck and said to myself, hmm, I wonder if there's an opportunity for cultural artifacts, um, primary sources in Africa to be aggregated in the same way. So I did an audit again, and we found that there were over a million items um, uh, pertaining to African culture and heritage spread across hundreds of institutions around the world. Ironically, many of the user interfaces on those collections uh, were not mobile friendly and had no language translation capability. So what this meant is even though there's a lot of African cultural heritage available, it's actually inaccessible to the originators of that content. And so the more we looked, we were like, hmm, this would be a really interesting opportunity. So. A month ago, uh, we launched Africa Commons. It aggregates and indexes um, uh, collections uh, uh, across 600 institutions, about 100 of those uh, from Africa. We also made it possible for individuals to upload content directly in the database. So historically, there's been a distinction between um, content management systems and dissemination systems. But by linking those two together and using automated tools to do a level of indexing, we'll actually allow, enable people to submit content and a minute later, it's accessible to the community. Now, I know this violates a lot of shibboleths. Um, of course, peer review is an issue. Of course, there's a need to make sure that the content is actually uh, reasonably high quality. But my colleague Toby Green, who built the publishing system for the OECD, has been allowing uploads like this for many, many years. And the number of violations are relatively small. They happen from time to time, and things need to be flagged. A far larger problem is persuading people to upload. Most people don't want to upload. So the nice thing here is that we will enable African institutions to actually upload content themselves. In the past year, I've uh, conducted over 40 interviews with African librarians, and the issues they are facing are crashingly simple. We have uh, materials being damaged by water. People are stealing pamphlets if they're uh, valuable. These materials could be relatively easily captured if we violated principles. Another example would be finding aids. 
I said, why haven't you got your finding aids up? Well, EAD is really expensive to create, and we don't have any resources to de disseminate EAD compliant data. Well, do you have Word documents that actually describe this content? Oh yeah, we've got Word documents. Well, why don't we just upload the world Word documents and make them accessible? So there are certain principles here which I've already touched on, and Christian's going to explain these in a little bit more detail. But the principles here are actually in some ways quite radical, and I'm not suggesting they supplant existing processes. I'm suggesting they're brought up alongside existing processes, because the challenging challenge we're facing here is an orders of magnitude more difficult than we've done with books and journals. We simply cannot have uh, these artifacts disappearing because we insist on perfectly formed marks or really, really high quality uh, Zeutschel scanner level uh, uh, copies. It's far more important that we preserve the artifacts before they disappear and make them accessible to the communities that created them uh, than it is for us to uh, observe traditional um, uh, items. So I'm going to finish here by just talking a little bit about some of the principles we've come up with. Uh, one is fault tolerance. So when Google gives you a result set and there's an error in the Google result, um, a result set, I don't hear faculty going, oh, that Google, it's useless. Very often they're like, they gave me 20 good results. And the fact that five of those results were poor isn't an issue for them. Now, again, I'm not suggesting we uh, litter faults across our content, but AIs typically only get you to 97, 98%, even if they're good. So the cost of cleaning that 2% or 3% is way higher, in my opinion, than the cost of letting that content go out and be subsequently corrected. So another principle is what Christian and I call event-based cataloging. There's no such thing as a catalog record that's finished in my book. As AIs improve, cataloging must improve. As we get ever better systems for entity extraction, the idea that we would simply freeze the catalog record and keep it the same way seems to me to be wrong. We should allow the catalog record to evolve over time. I've not touched on preservation yet. Um, Carol's going to talk a little to this. But in the African model, we have seen uh, link rot and disappearance of sites like you wouldn't believe. The half-life of a think tank in Africa is under four years. And typically what happens is it's like a flower. It blossoms. It produces magnificent reports. And a couple of years later, those reports have disappeared. Capturing those pieces of content is something that we're doing in Policy Commons. We have to do it respectfully, of course. But like the Internet Archive, we keep a copy. We only show that copy um, in the event that the link breaks. Otherwise, we route the traffic back to the original site. So in a short talk like this, I don't have time to go through all the principles. But I'd be very, very happy to talk with any of you here individually. If you'd like to check out these databases, there's a freemium business model. Anybody here can get access to them simply by registering at policycommons.net or africacommons.net. And just as a side note, Africa Commons is freely available to the continent of Africa and to HBCUs. We think that the um, uh, openly available content is a critical ingredient, ingredient of driving engagement. So with that, I'm going to stop. And perhaps uh, questions later. Thank you. Um, so uh, I, I became interested, I mean, I knew about the work of coherent at scale and coherent digital and you know, through my um, clear involvement. But um, I, I came at it from the angle of the work I've been doing and in my in sort of intellectual struggles and research struggles and trying and dealing with content in the wild and, the, and where will it be? Um, you know, all this knowledge, all this born digital material lost to the future of the world, um, lost to future knowledge. How can libraries um, cope with this? Um, some of you might recall that at CNI in 2019, 
Um, Clifford uh, and I, Clifford Lynch and I, uh, is there another Clifford? I don't know. Um, <laughs> there's some, um, kind of raised this wicked um, problem in a joint presentation. Um, we titled it uh, Memory Institutions and Deep Digital Disruption Beyond the Technical Challenges of Born Digital Preservation. And um, is among the um, observations, we, we noted that collecting and stewardship are essential prerequisites of preservation. And, and so who is doing that collecting and stewardship, even though we know technically how to do preservation? I know there's issues at scale, but we, I think CD can address that too. So, um, and what we were looking at is, is the extent to which our institutions, all of us, um, really lack the infrastructure, and we mean all aspects of infrastructure, not just the technical infrastructure, the organizational infrastructure, the financial infrastructure, the human resources infrastructure, the conceptual infrastructure, to really deal with this kind of unpublished, wild, wild's a good term, <laughs> content at any kind of scale. Um, and, uh, and, you know, this problem, of course, hasn't, hasn't been solved. Um, two years later, um, again, Cliff and I, because we've been, I mean, he's doing so many things, but um, uh, digital stewardship is an uh, important part. Um, we published companion articles in Against the Grain, and by that time, I'd sort of come around to realizing that the library role was still so important in this. I, I was kind of hoping that society would somehow solve this problem, but society thinks it has solved this problem. It has cultural heritage and memory institutions, and it's, you know, dumped this problem back on us. So here we are. Um, Cliff's article delved really deeply in a very interesting way into the nature of the web, whereas I was focusing on the web as a, a treasure chest of intellectual content that really needed to be excavated and used. Um, and the point, of, you know, so my article was titled Collecting from the Web, Collection Development Policy in the Born Digital Universe. And the point of that very short piece was to kind of illustrate the kinds of content that are completely relevant and within libraries collecting policy if it was published in some other way than in the wild on Born Digital. Um, but even as I kind of made that plea to librarians in that article, um, I, I realized that's, they're, they're listening to this and they're not disagreeing, but the reality is they lack the feasibility and capacity in most institutions to really figure out how to address this. So I started trying to analyze it and look around and think, so now what? You know, even if people understand this, what are they gonna do? And the more I kind of noodled around with coherent digital, I had this literally, literally eureka moment. Um, I'm not making this up. No one's paying me to say this. Um, <laughs> there is no money to pay me to say this. But, um, and I realized that coherent digital, because of the tools that it has and the way it's designed and because of Stephen's continual work and open-mindedness is not just please buy my package of digital content that I've produced, even though they have good packages and do go ahead and buy them. But they've got tools that let you do your own curation, your own capture, your own edition. It, you know, if we can figure out how to put this all together the right way, and that's why the partnership with CLEAR is so important, is we actually have a way forward on capturing and preserving and curating, you know, born digital content that's important. So um, I'm gonna stop there and move along, but that's, I'm, I'm controlling my excitement. So. And I'm going to be brief, I, as we're running up on time, I, I wanna be um, cognizant of everyone's time here. Um, one of the things that made me very excited when uh, we started having these conversations uh, is a project I've been working on for about seven years now, the Digital Library of the Middle East. One of the biggest problems that we've been running into for content from the MENA region is actually um, people are excited, they have collections, they have absolutely no infrastructure whatsoever to be actually do anything about it. They don't have the personnel, the equipment, or anything to really stand up these collections and be able to do anything with it. So 
you have to start looking at creative ways to figure out way, how do you actually get this online in, in a way. Um, and it's one of the things that I'm most excited about. Um, being able to partner with a, a for-profit company that has figured out some of these things, that has, I can actually go to these people now and say, I have a solution. Um, to explore and be able to um, put this in the hands of the people that actually own and um, love these collections, um, often in the middle of deserts, um, often um, fighting climate change with fires and, and all of the things that you have in, in other places, um, just exacerbated um, by um, their, their remoteness. And, and when I th think about scale, um, we, we ta often talk about scaling up, but I also think about scaling down. How do we take our approaches and get them suited to a context that fits the local instances. So um, that's what I'm excited about, and I'm going to be quiet now and, and turn it over to Christian. Good. Well, I think in, in time here, we're also here for Allison Levy to hear about uh, diversifying digital publishing, and uh, which fits very well with our, our panel theme here. So I'm eager to hear what you have to say, and I know many of you are here. So I'm going to leave maybe with our panel here just a, uh, a metaphor to think about. So again, I introduced myself as a practitioner. So I'm mainly, I'm looking at my colleague Jennifer Gunder as, as, as an archive, archives administrator, special collections curator. I've spent most of my career doing that. Um, you're hearing about themes about taming wild content, right? That there are more things than journals and books. There's uh, presentations we have. I'm seeing Kimberly at, you know, ephemera at Princeton and Yale is the same thing. So I'm tired of being a zookeeper. That's what I do. <laughs> I'm a zookeeper, right? I acquire things and I hand it off to my uh, catalogers and, and archives processors who are fantastic. And some months later, as we work our way down the queue, we have a process collection. And then, you know, we prioritize and we consider copyright and other things and eventually we digitize it, okay? And that's when it becomes sort of available to the world. That's where you don't have to just come to my zoo, you can see some, you know, visit our website for the zoo, okay? We need to flip that. The tools are here now, right? I mean, I'm looking at things on my phone. I type in a, a keyword and it finds it through handwriting analysis of pictures of poems that I take, you know, with annotated type scripts. Why are we not doing that in libraries? Why are we not digitizing that is the very first thing that we do? And then, you know, extract as much as we can quickly, automatically, apply, yes, our best talents in cataloging, Carol. You know, cataloging must change. You remember Carol Mandel's article years ago, okay? Cataloging they weren't born change. when that was written. <laughs> All right, they weren't, okay. But still, you know, we, we have, we can put those resources to it, but as part of the chain, again, with our users who know a lot more about our content than we do. Um, and then we can, you know, we, so that's the idea here. So we just need to kind of flip that around, use the tools that are out there, and, and get on this platform. That's what we need to build is a platform and not our local repositories, not our local zoos. So I'll leave you with that. I want to be the naturalist, okay, <laughs> not the zookeeper. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you.